the coaches call and we'll start off with if anybody has any questions. Jay, are you, I think that nothing new in that new robot game thing contradicts any information that you guys have already given us. I was looking for a gotcha, but I never really saw a gotcha in there. <laughs> Peggy's here. She'll throw a gotcha out here in a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, so, no, the only thing that was in there, Jen, I, I'm sure you read it. It was just um, that they just clarified, in their words, that you can't hand anything from um, one zone to the other. They had stated the robot before, so they just expanded that to anything. So. Okay. And then the other thing, I just wanted to confirm, um, it looked like in the pictures that they sent out in that clarification that they only addressed... Uh, if there were two people running the robot, three people running the robot, or I guess four people running the robot, is there an option to have one person run the robot and jump side to side? No. Okay. There must be at least two at the, at the table. So the idea is you have to have at least two people on a team, right? So if you have two people on a team, there must be one on each side and they can't cross over. Okay. And then if there's three, you have to put two on one side, one on the other. And they can, so no one can cross over at all. Until the okay. match is over. Your next match, of course, you can redistribute. But during the match, there's no crossover. Okay. It'd be like herding cats, I'm sure. Yes, it's it's definitely a magical experience over <laughs> in my basement. I'm sure. That was my only question for today. Wow, Okay. Okay, my kids have a question, and I think I already oh, know the answer, dang. but I'll verify. Hi, how are um, you? So they sometimes have trouble seeing the screen on their EV3. Um, so they found a brick out of a standard building set, but and it lights up. So is this considered an electric Lego equipment at that point? Yes. Okay. So not allowed, right? Uh, I'm... <laughs> Pretty sure. I'm going to look into that. I, I think. I think the answer is no. Okay. I think you're only allowed to have the um, the batteries for the. I, I have the. I have my book here. I just want to make sure that's called out. But yeah, they should be able to find another brick like that, right? That isn't electronic. It says non-electronic. Yeah, non-electric Lego pieces are allowed from any set. Electric okay. Lego yep. equipment is allowed only as designated and shown below. So only the um, robot stuff. Yep, they thought since they found it in a standard building kit that maybe. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> Craig, I haven't seen and, you either uh, yet this year. It's been busy. What can I tell you? It's, it's the same answer I get from every single person. My son transitioned up to FRC, so, oh, um, so. we're drinking. We're drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> but my daughter's still in FLL and. Uh, FFL and I will be uh, judging tournaments. So nice. nice. Brian's happy to hear that. Yep. Yeah. Looking forward to it. I'm already signed up for Marquette. Oh, we'll good. See what else. Well, I'll be there. We'll see you there. Yeah, definitely. I had a question for you, Jay, actually. Okay. This one's kind of esoteric. So last year, the Parkitects had a jig that launched the, um, the turbine blade from home or from launch underneath the turbine belay block and got the points for having a touch um that launch was initiated by the bot pulling out of home um i should say out of launch this year with the new uh model where there's two launch spaces and with there being motivation to move things from one launch to another um potentially <laughs> i'll take that I'm, I'm watching your input uh we were thinking about using a um, Lego has some new um, pullback motors that are, um, you know, you, you power them up and then you could release them. My question to you is if it's powered up and put into launch, does the robot have to initiate the launch of that device across the table? Or can a kid like if it was so like before the match, if I rolled it back and I loaded it up in home and it's sitting there in home loaded, ready to roll, and I got the dyno and I put it on top of it, and the bot's out on the playing board, can I just hit the, can I just let it go and shoot it across the board? Or does the release have to be a function of the robot leaving launch? 
Yeah, I think we'll have to break that down into two steps. Um, so I did actually look. Jeff, have you seen anything about the pullback motors this year? I did look for it earlier this year. I did not. So I, I, I can look again, but uh, my first pass through is that they removed that and those are now allowed. Yeah, because I, I specifically looked earlier this year because I was looking for a situation like that. Okay. Um, but what you just described, I don't believe is legal. Right. Based on page 19, rule four. Okay, Technicians may not touch anything outside of their home or cause anything to move or extend outside of home. Oh, sorry, extend outside this area except the robot. Okay. All right. So if we designed it into our jig and when the robot leaves, it releases that thing, then we're still okay like we were last year. We just can't have a human being launch it. Yeah, so as we're technically attachment. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Right. So as we're as we're looking, um, I'm looking over page 17 over and over again because you know, somebody had mentioned a pullback motor early in the season. Yep. And then they decided they weren't going to use it, but I was scouring the rules because that used to be specifically not allowed. I don't see I don't see where they're disallowing that so stick stick around for a little bit i'm going to read this a couple times as we get into some other things but uh like jeff said i didn't see anything that i don't see anything that disallows it but yeah it definitely has to be released by the robot fair enough um sub note um did the uh the slack channel change ownership at some point because i don't seem to be seeing any activity in the slack channel has it been being used yes okay Maybe try logging and, out. And also, again. no, the Slack channel has not changed. It's the same uh, oh. channel that's been used for the last couple of years. Yeah, sorry, my yes was yes, it's being used, not yes, it's. Yeah, yeah no, that's what I, I, I. That's how I took it. It's W I F L L volunteers. No. W I F L L coaches. It's... Volunteers is not used that much. Coaches is this is the yeah. one for this group. How do I get invited into the coaches one? Twenty bucks. <laughs> okay. Next tournament, I see it. No, it no, no, no. Next tournament, you see me. Do not hand me money. Do not hand me money. <laughs> that would not. <laughs> I just do it during the game. It's right. <laughs> but I swear, I swear, Mister Cayman, he asked me to pay right. him twenty dollars. <laughs> um, this is being recorded, right? Yeah, I'll put um, my email in the yeah. uh, chat. You can um, just add it in there. That'd be great. I'm sure we'll have it. We'll have it for you here in a minute. On a similar note, has there been a um, weekly uh, emails going out? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm not getting. getting those. You even confirmed I'm on the list. And if, if I email you one on one, I get it. And then I got the most recent one as a reminder for the deadline for registration. And I haven't gotten a single other one. All right. Um, if you can input in the chat your email, then I will make sure that you're added again. And we'll see. Have you checked your spam to see if maybe it went in there? Yeah, I checked okay. spam. Yeah. I even whitelisted your your email address to make sure there was no problem with it. Okay. But like I say, I got one last week from you. I just haven't gotten one all season. Okay. Yeah, I've been trying to send them out on Thursday afternoons around four huh. o'clock ish. So. Huh. Yeah, I got the one saying reminder: tomorrow's the deadline for registering teams. But I hadn't gotten anything prior to that. All right, I'm gonna. I'll. I'll. I'll make sure that you're added again. Okay. Did you get the one last week saying that the tournament assignments were done? No. Oh, guess what? Oh, huh. <laughs> tournament assignments are done. <laughs> I'll have to go look for those. Have you checked your spam folder? Yeah, like I said, I checked spam, I checked junk, I checked it both on my, my PC and on my at, at my provider, and I whitelisted the uh, the address to make sure that it wouldn't get blocked. Like I say, I can get one on one emails. It's not the it's the weekly newsletter. You know, every so often I think they look at if it's a big distribution list, they, they think it's spam. And I think it's not actually getting past 
my provider to, to get as far as my account, but I'll, uh, I'll send you my work address and that, that'll just fix it. It can go to work. Yeah, if you in the chat, if you just send me uh, your email, I'll go in and I'll add it and make sure that it's in. And then, uh, yeah, if you don't get one Thursday late afternoon, then we'll do some more checking. All righty. Any more easy questions? Oh, here's Elijah. Oh, boy. This is not going to be easy. What's up, Elijah? Experiencing um, Mr. 14 or the Toy Factory having energy units um, actually fall out of really inserted. Okay, you're really breaking up for me, bud? Hold on. You're breaking up for me? Oh, crap. Um, Try again. Or or put it in put it in the chat if you guys need to. Any other questions? I was just looking um to see if it still talks about there being just two kids at the end of the match for the scoring that sit with the ref, or if that's changed with the two homes and hmm. I, I can't find anything. So, or for inspection, you know, how many kids should be up there? Yep. So um, I don't remember. I'm going to look at the, the pre-match again. I don't remember they're saying only two kids for inspection. So, and for scoring, only because I think it's going to be really crowded, right? When we're trying to score with four kids and a referee and potentially a head ref answering anything needs to be done. So, I mean, I don't think there's anything preventing the technicians from from scoring, but if you have a couple that are designated to do it, it'd probably be easier and make things a little smoother. But you know, I don't see anything either that says that the you know the four kids can't be there. Okay. So I'm looking at the pre match now. Yeah, it just says all the kids or all the equipment must fit into the two launch. It doesn't say. Um, well, you know, I guess I guess you could expect four because you're really not supposed to cross over <laughs> each side. So I would assume that it, the kids on the red side would want to have their stuff set up. The kids on the blue side would set their kid, their side up, right? But for the inspection, they just want to be in one one of the two sections and then split. Is that right? No, you can use both of them for both for. Um, it says all the team's equipment must fit into the two launch areas. And fit under 12 inches. Now, if they can fit in one, the height of 12 inches, they get the extra points. But they can okay. use both areas if they need to. I, I get what you mean. You're asking, you know, to get the 20 points. Then, yeah, you'll want to set it up in the one. Um, or do your inspection in the one area. I'm and assuming the they can then hand things at that point prior to the match, right? Yeah, so... So okay. once the inspection's done before the match, then they can divvy their stuff up where it goes. Okay. It says that you have, <clears throat> quote, a couple minutes um, to prepare for the match. Okay. Along the lines of that, if we have 10 kids so and four runs. So we were going to have, you know, four kids on the red side, four kids on the blue side. And then the last two kids were going to do inspection. And um, so with that, do they need to have a designated side, even though they're only doing inspection and then they won't be back at the table? Yes, ma'am. Until... Okay. Does it matter if they're, does it have to be even like, does one have to be red and one have to be blue or can they like, does it matter? So there's a, um, tell us how they have to split it up. Jeff, do you know if they have it's to be even? the illustration of the book, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I know they, they call out... 
call out what happens if you have three kids and two kids. I'm looking for the page in a book, sorry. Jeez, how long is this book? Okay. <laughs> Team members must then divide into two groups and position one group at each side of the table. These members cannot switch. If possible, position two technicians at each home area. All other team members must stand back. Teams may never have more than two technicians at a single home area, but team members may swap places with a technician on their side at any time. Um, I don't see where it says it and has there, to be. Do you okay. also have the... Uh, are you also looking at the clarification... Uh, five did, in the game updates. Did, that's my next pull up. Did you want to share or tell uh, us? No, you can go ahead with that. No, I, I have to look it up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, actually, I should update that. Let's see. Uh, clarification five um, match setup. As per match setup four, Team members must divide into two groups and position one group at each side of the field, left and right. These members cannot switch sides during the match. If possible, position two technicians at each home area. And then it gives uh, for teams of two or three, setup is as follows. For a team of two, you have one on each side. For a team of three, you have two on one side, one on the other, and it doesn't matter which side has two and which side has one. So and then further, again, repeats, these members cannot switch sides during the match. I do not see where it says they have to be divvied up equally on each side. Right. I've not seen anything about it being equal. Okay. And Except then for that if you have, if you have more than, if you have four or more kids, two have, at least two have to be on each side. Right. Okay, and then the, the kids that are up there for inspection, though it doesn't matter what side they're from, they can move all over setting up without a problem. Yeah, the inspection is not part of the match. Um, that's right. pre-match. And, and so. during, in, during inspection, the goal or a goal could be to fit everything you've brought to the table in one launch area for a bonus. So possible if you're doing that all the kids could be or the kids doing the inspection could all be on one side of the table yep. right but then they're going to have to take all of the stuff and split it between the two sides so they'd be crossing yes. over that's where all the questioning comes in okay but let's be clear about that emily they're allowed to this is actually kind of what peggy just asked a minute ago um so you get extra points if you do all your inspection all in one area so the time between the inspection, after the inspection's done, and be and before the match starts, your kids can move the stuff over to the other side. The match has not started yet, so you can divvy yourself up after the inspection. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to clarify. Thank you. And I'll just make it very clear for people watching the video that can't ask a follow-up question. So, it's we're talking about two separate things. Inspection is its own animal okay um after the inspection is done the time between inspection and the start of the match three two one lego the kids can move some of their as much of their stuff as they want from one uh, home area to the other but when that once a match is started they're not permitted to um, transport themselves or physically Transport items between the man between the the home areas, except for by the robot. That's it. So. And do we know yet how like the referees are going to know? Like, how are, are they going to have like little red and blue lanyards on, or is there going to be just tape on the floor? Like, how is it going to be like determined who's on what side? Good one. Um, yeah. But there's been talk about making boxes or lines. I think some tournaments are just going to do uh, a line. Um, some tournaments, I think we're planning on doing like a little a box, a red box. Or they may not be red and blue. It'd be helpful if they were red and blue. But a box for each side to stand in so they don't cross over. 
So it, on the just extending on that, and are you guys using left, right, or east, west as the nomenclature for the launches? And you, I'm using red and blue myself okay, personally. Okay. Um, if if a bot is launched from the red side and it's out on the board and it fails closer to the blue side, what's the handling there? Yeah, so when it's when it's interrupted, if it's completely outside of the launch area, it can yep. be it can be um, taken into either launch area. Obviously, obviously penalties included or, or whatever, you know. Well, just to run this through my head, so if the bot left home with mission, I'm gonna I'm I'm messing up the nomenclature, but you're, you'll roll with me here. If if it left with mission pieces, so off of the board pieces that had been legally collected earlier. Um, and then the the red team launches it, and then the blue team picks it up. Theoretically, they just did a transfer. Now they're going to get hit with a precision token, but it's they still get to keep those parts because as long as they weren't gathered during that part of the run. Does that make sense? Did I say that well? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That that does seem to be the way we're we're currently interpreting the rules. Is that uh, um, that does seem to be kind of a loophole that, uh, um, and I think we've submitted a question first on that, correct, Jay? Along with the 13 others, yes. Uh, so first <laughs> knows that that's a, a loophole we've pointed out to them right now. If the tournament was happening at this exact moment, uh, I think we would allow that. There's nothing to say that first might not come out with an update next week that says, we're plugging that hole and you're not allowed to do that. Yeah. That's, I, I wasn't a big fan when they decided to give you the first precision token for free for just this reason right here. Yeah. Cause you can bake it into your mission strategy to have a intended failure. That was, I, that was their justification yeah. for doing that is they wanted to give another piece of strategy to the teams that yes. they could decide where they should use that. Yeah. I mean, there's always been strategic rescue. Right, so they're right. just adding it as an yeah. as a and, as a and, viable and option. Even, even before the you got one for free, right. there was still a decision. Well, if I take this penalty, yep. can yep. I get even more points by getting this robot home quickly? And yep. so that's always been out there. It's just they're trying to emphasize it more by giving it to you for free. And so, just to reiterate, so we're thinking if we ran a tournament today. Uh, when, unless they elaborate more, that it would be basically the first precision token taken off for a for a transfer like that. Well, you're definitely going to lose a precision uh, token. Yep. Yeah. But, it's but, it's but, but no, no point third, deduction. But, but yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, if, if it's the first thing you've done that requires removing a precision token, there won't. There's no point reduction. Yeah. If you if your robot got stranded and you have already rescued at one time, yeah, then you're going to lose. Is is it something where the if there's time. a pattern of them handing the robot off like that, like no, there's nothing in the rules that says right. we watch for patterns. Okay. So where, where it comes back to bite you, even though it's free, it may not be free the longer you get into the match, right? So if you strategically exactly. plan one rescue. Right, and you're saying, okay, we don't lose anything. What happens if one of your runs doesn't go according to plan? So now you're losing points yep. that you didn't plan. On. It's you know, it's all part of the strategy. So you guys, yeah. are... I'm just worried about right. my kids being able to program their programs from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, yeah, they, they may not get to all of those options. So uh, having the ability, I mean, there, there's to, nothing to pass there's it, nothing even if there's the a rules. penalty, right? Yeah. Well, let's there, be... there's nothing in the rules that say that you have to launch the robot from one side or the other. I mean, you could have two team members stand on the, on the blue right side and do nothing the whole time. I mean, first goal was that both sides take turns and, but you don't have to do that. There's nothing in the rules that require it. Yeah. And we still have, we still have the intent of like, you know, having the robot do most of the passes between the two locations, but it's just, it could be a lot of time. Yeah, and I want to be careful about saying passing because you know you're rescuing. Yeah, it's not like you're you're handing it, but right. yeah. 
you can legitimately hopefully, drive. Hopefully, like, it's the like, robot do nothing but drive from, from a launch to a launch. Yeah, right? just drive straight. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, th- I mean, you know, from a coaching standpoint, that would be my theory: is I'm driving, you know, 100 percent speed from one to the other, right? Exactly. In case I don't, you know, in case I have to do some unplanned rescue later, because then. Because everything's going perfect at your, you know, at your practice facility. Once you're in tournament, <laughs> it's all out the window. Yep. So I, I guess I want to clarify um, one other aspect to the the two launch areas and the, the separation of the team into the the red and blue sides of the field. Um, that's you're allowed two technicians on the red side, two technicians on the blue side, and they're the ones that are allowed to manipulate what's in. The, the red home and the red launch area and the blue, the two blue technicians can manipulate what's in the blue home and launch area. You can't have red technicians go over to the blue side and man- manipulate things by hand. But once the robot's out on the table, I think there were some questions on earlier calls that, well, what if it launched from the red area and we wanted to come back to the red area, but the blue technicians can reach it? and interrupt it. That's not a problem. I mean, the blue, any technicians from either side can interrupt the robot and then it can go back to either side. So as a referee, I would not have an issue if the blue technicians interrupted the robot, picked it up. It's now an interrupted robot. They can hand it to a red team member and the red team member can then take it back to the red launch area because it's an interrupted robot. It's just they're not allowed to pick up anything from red home and carry it to the blue home. But once the robot's out on the field, it's that's a different thing. So Jay was shaking his head through most of that, so I think uh, we're in no, agreement on I that. I agree with you. I think we, we, went, we went over that during our meeting as well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there isn't going to be a dividing line that the red team can't move over to the right, to the right side of the table. They, the red team members could move over to the right side of the table and pick up a robot that's out completely outside of the blue area. They just can't launch the robot from the other side of the table. Their right. red team, they have to launch from their red side. Other questions about that? Oh, let me, I'm going to read a logic question. he has been having issues with M14 Toy Factory with energy units falling out of the base of the model after being properly inserted. Can this be argued as mission model failure? Has anyone else been having trouble with M14? Oh, Peggy is. No. We've had that too. And we've had it where when they dump them in, sometimes they jam and don't actually come out, which... If that first one comes out, then the dinosaur goes out. But if they all jam before that first one comes out, then it won't release the dinosaur necessarily. So is there a strategic way to make it work properly? Like go slower, go faster? I think that one they could um, if they drop them one at a time, which, you know, slows them down. But um, but they, they haven't tested that because they don't have it coded to go that way, yeah. but that's what I, but ours are, have bounced out occasionally. Um, like he says to, after it goes through and comes out the bottom and all of a sudden one will just fly out of there every once in a while. So I think you guys, I think about everybody here has uh, exception. I'm not sure if Ryan, but everybody on here is, has been in tournaments before and you guys know how we check um, for mission model failure. So at the end of the match, we will, you know, put something in there and make sure it's working properly. And if it works properly for us at the end of the match, it works properly. So if there's something that you can do strategically to go slower, go faster, and the fact that Peggy's having the same issue even points to me more that it's not a mission model failure, right? So it's built that way, and you just have to manipulate it the proper way. But we'll definitely, you know, if it looks like there's a model that's not functioning properly... We will always test the model at the end, and if it works, then um, you wouldn't get the um, mission model failure. If it doesn't work for us, if it jams for us as well, then you would get a mission model failure. That's kind of how we've always done it. So, 
Uh, I had a kid who was um, working on the, the Mission 14, and he was thinking about activating the dinosaur manually with a, an attachment and then later filling the, the um, thing with energy, like as two separate parts. I mean, maybe not the best uh, in terms of efficiency or whatever, but just um, as an idea. So it, it would have been like a, you know, like a pokey stick or something that, that you stick down in there to actually launch the uh, dinosaur. And I'm absolutely certain you mean manually as in not by hand, but. With the robot. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing that says you can't do it at separate times. I mean, the, the requirement is just that the, the mini dinosaur has been released. That's the mm-hmm. end point requirement for that. Right. So I guess to clarify what the issue is, is there ever an issue with the dinosaur getting released? It, if the units don't drop in, then it does. If they jam, it won't necessarily release. I, I don't think I've ever you're seen anything flip up in the dinosaur not come down, though. But you're having a problem with the first unit going in getting jammed? They, they dump three in kind of at the same time. And so sometimes oh, that will okay. jam. And when they come out every once in a while, when they, do, when they don't jam, sometimes they pop out the bottom part. Okay, so, so you have the issues you're experiencing is that they're dropping three in simultaneously and they're happening to a line where they get, they fill the in, input of the hopper. So, something down in there the is jamming, in. yeah. And when that happens, they, of course, don't fall all the way through to activate the, uh, the dinosaur release. Because it seems, my experimenting, it just takes one unit to release the dinosaur. But you're dropping in three at the same time. They're jamming. And then your other issue is that when they fall into the holding area, sometimes they bounce out. Yeah. Okay. Just curiosity question. What... Um... How did, how are they approaching the toy factory? Like, is there a dumping mechanism coming at it from the side where the little dinosaur drops so that it's kind of aimed back towards the collection hopper? Yeah, they're coming from like from that launch area and dumping yeah. it in as they go there. Yeah, we, we do it differently than that. Um, we haven't had the problem. I wonder if it's just... Just inertia when it hits the bottom, rolling out the back. When there's one in there, just looking at the picture. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely listen to what Jeff has to say as well. Um, but to me, if there's a strategic way you can make it work properly for you, that's what I would go with. Um, I don't think yes, it's a mission model I'd failure. Agree with that. If it's a strategy that you're implementing that's causing the failure, right? Well, that's that's what I'm curious. So if all three are going in too quickly and that causes it to jam but if they went in slower then that last one might be what's making it bounce out because obviously they're they're getting through the thing but then you know obviously they're not going through at the same right, time and that's causing the bounce out at the end we usually get two to jam mm-hmm. so i guess if i were testing that i would do i would probably drop one in test it drop or dr- drop one in um see if it functions properly and if it functions properly it's not a mission model failure, right? Right. And and we'll also look is the model built to right. the instructions. Of course. Yeah. And I mean I'm I'm guessing from what you're saying, your model is built correctly. It's just the method the kids have chosen of putting in three at a time is causing jams. And you've also discovered that the the design of the, the model, the output hopper is possibly a little small. And parts can bounce out of it. And so that to me seems like something that you need to look at your strategy of delivery. And is there anything you can do to keep them from bouncing out? Versus that I wouldn't consider that a mission model failure because the mission model is designed exactly as first said it should be. Yep. Agreed. The, the hinge mechanism in it seems to work fine. I mean, if, if for some reason the hinge was sticking and it wasn't moving, that would be a mission model failure. But if everything about the model is exactly the way first said we should build and deploy it, then it's not really a mission model failure. 
it's a design challenge for how you do the, the delivery correct uh, in the best way. Right. I mean, I just equate it to like a real world situation, right? If you have a conveyor belt yep. and you're trying to transport stuff, you throw 15 boxes on it jams, you got to figure a different way to do it. So, Right. You guys will get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Emily says we've seen the dinosaur get released, but not go down the ramp a few times. Just as an FYI. Yeah, I get it. Is there something specific stopping it from going down, Emily? Okay, so my, my son's in the car with me and he's the one that told me this. So do what do you know what happens when it happens? It just uh gets like it's just the square or something like gets caught. Like on the bottom of it, or like underneath the wheels, just to keep it like in, it just gets like caught, and then it doesn't go down. Like it gets cr- a little crooked. Is it because maybe, and I don't know, but is it because the robot, uh, the robot? Geez, sorry. Is it because the dinosaur isn't square in uh, the setup? It isn't properly set up, or is it actually um, kind of jumping track, so to speak, and not coming out? I don't. I don't know. It's just like it's <laughs> stuck and doesn't go. Yeah, I haven't seen it myself, so we'll we'll keep an eye on it though and see if it happens again. So well, that, that's good advice for us too. Um, so I'll try to make a note and uh, let referees know as well to double check those um, and the table, you know, because it can certainly be set up not squarely, right? So we might want to just try to glance over and make sure it looks good before the start. I mean, you know, because you guys know we miss stuff too. I mean, it's not every time the table's not always set up properly every time. So if we see something that is. Right. Uh, so we're normally looking at a model. It's a robot's coming towards it, right? We know what's supposed to happen. So if we're if you have a robot that's going over there and we see that the dinosaur is not square in there, we're going to give them the points for it if it's not set up properly. Right. right. That I would consider a mission model right. failure. Yeah. I mean, if the little dinosaur toy wasn't loaded straight, if one of the wheels is sticking out further than it should have been, it should have been clicked in all the way. I mean, that, that we consider a mission model failure. Because yep. the, the expectation is if the release lifts up high enough, then the, the dinosaur toy should roll out. Maybe another thought on that. We've been having an issue on our mission 10 with the middle dual lock piece coming um, unseated just enough where it sort of contorts it just slightly and it gets a little bit um, finicky there. I don't know if that same concept applies uh, to the toy factory or not, but that's something worth checking. It's some of those have little internal middle dual lock pieces that just checking that those are fastened well can sometimes help improve the the mission model behavior. Yeah. Understood. Um, We've, we've you, seen a little bit of a failure with Mission Model 7 on the first time you actuate it, and the robot's actuating the plunger all the way, the uh, ramp tips up, but that first uh, power unit kind of interlocks with the next one, and it doesn't slide down the ramp. Um, is that Mission Model failure, or is that just... Right, right now, we have the kids hit it four times, even though it should only take three. We have the robot do an extra one just to make sure. But uh, about one out of four times, one out of five times, we have the uh, the first power unit not slide down. Have you guys done the um, build update? Yeah, it's with the shorter piece of the ramp. Yeah. Or the shorter, yep. Yes. So we need that that happens up on the ramp perfectly every single time. So it's kind of just fire first thing. Yeah, you, you broke up for us, Emily. It doesn't jam. Yeah, Emily, oh, you, you broke. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we didn't. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Not now. You can hear me? <laughs> no. <laughs> it started out, but no. So, 
while while we're waiting for Emily to maybe get in a better area. So Dan, um, you said yours is just sporadic. Then yeah, is it an yeah. angle that you guys may be hitting it from or? You know, that one's going to be kind of hard to diagnose as a mission model failure as well, right? I mean, if it's working. Right. Yeah. Uh, like I say, about four out of five times it drops. Maybe one out of five, one out of four, it hangs up. And we've tried hitting it faster, slower. We tried pausing. And it, it really seems pretty sporadic. Um, it definitely, you know, because that first one can be slid back just a little bit so that it's not quite lined up with the... Uh, um, with the ones above it, you know, by one pulley diameter and that, that makes a difference, but there's nothing in the rules that say it has to be you know, set perfectly. Right. So yeah, you understand how that works, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, we set it up by, I mean, hypothetically when the table resetters or referees set it up, we get it in a proper position. Like we don't cater to a, can yep. you move that back or can you move that forward? As long as it's in a proper position, that's what we expect it to go. But Yep. Yeah. So um, that being said, for anybody that's new, your your team does get an opportunity yeah. so um, to look over everything at the table and make sure everything looks right. We especially, you know, we want the kids to see if something's wrong. I mean, we want it to be fixed before they start. So I would have them go over ex specifically every mission that they do. You know, if you guys know you have something like that dual lock situation, you can ask us to, hey, can you make sure that's seated? Can you make sure, you know, we don't mind checking stuff like that probably not going to pick up every model on the table and you know place it back down again but there's something you know gives you an issue and they're a little nervous about so hey can you check that dual lock on model seven right we don't have a problem making sure it's down where it's supposed to be something else we've noticed and this is more just a heads up for people because it actually makes it easier to score i've seen our mission model eight that watch television the little bin the energy unit pops into uh starts to pull apart and it makes the bin wider so that the energy unit sits in there more readily use it enough times that it kind of works its way open to the point where it's almost impossible to not have it catch and then when you push it back in it makes it easier to pop out so make sure that model stays pushed together because ours is sliding apart we have to push it together at least once a practice okay that's good information. As long as I'm on a roll, one last question. The car, yeah. <laughs> uh, you don't need to use the red handle to, to deploy that. If you bump the car, as long as the car is off the ramp, it scores, correct? Which, uh, which mission is that, Dan? Do you know? Uh, just scrolling through. It is mission... Oh, six. Six, yeah. I didn't see anything about you needing to use the handle. Right. Um, nope. If the hybrid car is no longer touching the ramp, or if the high or and sorry, start over yeah. again. Two criteria. If the hybrid car is no longer touching the ramp, ten points. If the hybrid unit is in the car, ten points, and I do not see anything that says it has to be activated by the lever. Okay. That's what I read too. Yep. Excellent. So as long as it doesn't say there's a specific way it has to be done, then there's not a way it has to be done. And so that's just another, that's another good example of something that may not be lined up properly. Right. So like imagine the, the car that we are, the, the dinosaur that we were talking about, same thing with the car. If we look over and it's not sitting square, you know, it's halfway off the ramp when you guys are heading towards it, you know, as long as they, try to activate that model, we're going to give a mission model failure if it doesn't come all the way down. I mean, I'd like to say that we're going to catch every single model build at the beginning of every match, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, just like you guys, when you're practicing and you're doing your runs, I mean, yeah. there's stuff that doesn't get reset. So, you know, we, we try, we'll do our best. So what's the situation like with the wind turbine, if they actually are, jammed and they don't come off so that afterwards you know you guys test it and it's not coming off but therefore because that jammed they didn't have those units to potentially score with later how does that work that's a good question peggy in years past we wouldn't they needed to have 
run the mission like if they had a basket to deliver them, run the mission as if they had power units in their basket to get the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, but the problem is if you don't have a basket or something, like where would they fall and how would you collect, you know, would there's just a lot of run on stuff there. But yeah, um, I think yep. that was Dan. And if the kids can communicate to us during the match and let us know, hey, that that jammed and hey, we would have used yep. those parts here. I mean, that makes it very clear to us. Yep. So we know what to look for. So the more they can communicate, the better. But it'll really be a case by case basis. If they, so I mean, I, I do agree with what, um, kind of where Dan was going with that. If you're running, if you have a tray or something or a slide that you're running over there and the, the model jams and it doesn't go into the slide, if you continue to move that slide where it would go to, you know, collect points, I mean, I would listen to that argument. Right. Yeah. If it's, if it's a jam, but you must still activate the other stuff. You must take that slide and put it where you were going to before pretend like it failed, you know, the, the pieces fell. Because if you don't try it, we can't just award the points. But yeah. So if they deliver just one or two to someplace else because they're missing them from that? Yeah, if they make the argument and the, and the model actually fails, I don't have a problem with that. Right. Now, I'm, I'm personally very interested in how this, is, this model is failing for right. you because, I mean, looking at the one I have here at home, I'm not seeing how it would jam. It's, and so uh, if you're able to capture that on like a cell phone video or something, I think Jay and I both would be interested in seeing that. Yeah, It, it is kind of that sporad sporadic thing that, you know, maybe it is the line. Well, you are recording all of your practice practices. matches, aren't you? Of course. <laughs> Everybody does. I did tell the kids they yeah. could the other day because they couldn't figure out <laughs> what was making something go weird. But of course it worked that time. That I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> and it's an excellent troubleshooting thing to, I mean, use a cell phone camera, do slow motion playback. Dan, there's, mean, there's, there's absolutely, that you don't... absolutely no way this is going to fail right now, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see how they're, they're in, kind of interlocked. Yeah. That yes. seems to be the condition that causes the fit. When they fail, you can clearly see one ridge has caught on the other. Yeah. Or I think we've seen that also. But I guess I'm not seeing if the red plunger is pushed in all the way. I'm not. I mean, it would separate those parts, even if they were interlocked. So I'm yeah. not seeing how it jams. More often than not, it does. But the, every so often, it's always the first one. It's never, it's never the second or third. It's always the first. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, if you can capture it on video, I'd, yeah. I'd be interested in seeing that. Yep. Will do. Because I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. I haven't seen um, other than manually <laughs> manipulating models. I haven't seen teams run on the table yet. So I haven't seen hundreds of, of runs at these things yet. I'm just manually manipulating by hand and, you know, since this has been rebuilt, or since the windmill update, I haven't had a jam in it. But I'm not hitting it at different angles from a programmed robot. So, and you've made the modification to re to remove the uh, the one piece from the model and center the remaining one. You're gonna Dan or me on the, the wind turbine. Yeah, I was asking Dan. Yeah, I think he said they did. That was oh, like I, I I hit mute instead of killing my camera. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. Now, in general, it's been a really reliable field. There's just once in a while that one one model is the only thing we've had issues with. Just to be sure, we did get an answer to Jeff's question there. You you did the um up the build update right. <laughs> Dan. Yep. Okay. You did the build update. Yep. Okay. Right there. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. That, that looks right. Yeah, we'll try to catch it on, on uh, video. We'll make sure everything's pushed together real well too. Any other questions? Or Okay, my kids have asked me this several times. Where are the precision tokens during the match? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, the referees want to know that too. Well, the referees that have been doing it for a while kind of have a, I mean, I, I used to hold them in my hand anyway, and I used to take them out of my hand and put them on the side. 
but I guess we'll have to uh, reevaluate where they're going to go because we used well, to put them over historically, in the historically. So. They were they would oftentimes start on the field, and the referee would pick them up off the field and right. hold them in their hand or yep. leave them on the side of the table. I mean, now they they start in the referee's hand and they end in the referee's hand, and so that's going to be a challenge. It'll be a challenge if it's uh, you know once you're going from three to four or two to three. It's like what hand was I? What hand was it? Was it uh... Yes. <laughs> we'll figure something out, Peggy. Okay. The thing that made me remember that question was um, page eighteen, where it said, you know, they start under number three. They start by distributing their equipment and loose mission models between the two homes. Except for some mission models must start in a specific home area. What other mission models are loose other than the dinosaur and the precision tokens? What are they even talking about? Innovation model. The innovation model is equipment. Uh, but doesn't it relate to a mission? Would it not be a mission also? Yeah, but de by definition, anything you bring to the table with you is equipment. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know, Peggy. I'm not missing anything, right? Not that I can think of. I don't think so. I, I mean, that's, so. I guess one thing to keep in mind is even though FIRST changes the rules on us every year, they consider the rules to be generic and available for future years. So they may have written them in a way that maybe they don't, aren't really applicable this year, but they're thinking, oh, in future years they will. But next year they'll completely rewrite them anyway. So. <laughs> But their their goal is always that the the rules, once they get them perfect, will never have to change again. Mm. Notice how I didn't comment on that. <laughs> so I guess you know we could talk briefly about um, we did we kind of mentioned if first releases an update on something, right? So the way we have done that before, and I think. Um, Jeff and I and a couple of the referees discussed that. Um, so if it's your week of tournament and there is, you guys are at tournament on Saturday and there's an update on Thursday, you know, we, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but we won't, apply, we won't force apply that update if they're two days out from tournament, right? Um, I think I'd look at it a little bit differently, but you're, I'm guessing you'll be in agreement is, we're not going to penalize a team because the rules changed. But go. if the rules change in your favor, I think we'd apply it immediately. Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, I agree with that. Jeff is so much more eloquent than I am. Are there any more questions from anyone? So there was a generic question in um, Slack earlier about um, a team was looking to reserve a bus. Can we give a generic answer on when they should um, arrive to a tournament so they can plan ahead? Obviously, there are no times yet, but if you were going to rent a bus for teams to, to go to a tournament, what would you guys plan on? Teams have gotten to the or the Madison Regional Tournament. Any idea on what's the best time to arrive? They're organizing a bus. So, what advice would we give them if? I think we'd want to advise them like the answer that was given in Slack to aim for for a early arrival, um, but then be prepared once they're their specific tournament releases, the, the welcome packet uh, about a week in advance may have updated times. Um, I mean, we know uh, from discussions with Appleton uh, that they're, since they're a very small tournament being the very first one this season, uh, that they're possibly looking at uh, reducing the, the schedule for the day um, and possibly stating, starting large, tongue-tied here, starting later than most tournaments would usually start. 
And so you really should look to the tournament you're attending to provide you the exact schedule. But I, I think on average, the, the answer that was given in Slack is accurate. Yep. I agree. I wanted to repeat it on here in case somebody didn't see it on Slack. That's kind of where I was going with it. <laughs> I did answer this in the chat, but um, I was asked about concessions for the section for the uh, scrimmage. There will be uh, concessions for scrimmage. I will uh, work on getting the uh, the options menu, whatever together. Um, I, I have volunteers taking care of that, so I don't have that information. But I'll work on getting. <laughs> work on getting that and then uh, just to plug there are still additional slots open for the scrimmage on Saturday so even if you're not you know you, we don't expect you 100% for a scrimmage so come you know it's a great day of working seeing what other teams are doing and um, getting together with the judges and going through what you got you know if you got a draft of a presentation that's great if you kind of want to talk through your research or whatever, you know, we kind of have those conversations too. Where is the scrimmage again? Waukesha South High School. Okay. On Saturday. Thank you. Are you yeah. in Slack? I am. Okay. Because I posted it in Slack. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. Emily, I know you were driving, but um, I think you were one of the ones that was looking for um, another spot if they opened up. So I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but we just wanted to move the spot because it was at like 8 a.m. <laughs> so we, we're now at 10 a.m. and we're much happier. <laughs> okay, good. We with wanted the, desperately. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. With uh, with that, okay, so the, just to confirm, the robot table, um, there, you're, we're not going to have like matches head to head. It's just tables will be available where we can get on and practice like running through and, and that kind of stuff, right? Brian can let us know what we're planning on for tables there, but um, normally what we'll do, I'll be there and I know Eric O will be there. So the matches that we run on the table, we'll time, we'll run like a, a tournament. I mean, we'll run like it as if it's a tournament. There'll be some tables to just practice on. And then if you want to work with the, the refs, they can time a match for you. Yep. So we just want to give them the opportunity to come to the table, go through an inspection uh, you know, just as if it were a regular match. So you, they can practice on the other tables, but if you come to the official table, <laughs> then we'll time that. Okay, so will there be like a sign-up sheet then? Or is it just first come, first serve? Or how are you going to navigate like when they start? Like when just teams show up and want to go head-to-head? Or <laughs> I don't know. We'll work it out. Okay, we're just on a time crunch in the afternoon for one kid, but if they have to leave early, it's not the end of the world. I got you. Um, yeah, just come to the tables. It's you know, there's usually only one or two teams waiting. If if there's nobody waiting, we'll usually let them run a you know an extra match or two. But if there's other people waiting, we'll have them run their match and move on to the practice table if they want. So we're not going to have we're not just going to let one team run over and over and over again. So we'll have a queue and yeah. Any other questions? Did I hear earlier tournament assignments are out? Yes, they are. Okay. Is that on uh, BadgerBots? It's on the uh, where you registered. Okay. So if you go on it. where you registered, it, it, it will list it there. And then also make sure you pay before uh, your tournament. Yep, we're all paying. Fantastic. Just a, a question on that. Are there are there wait lists for the other uh, tournament assignments? We have a few kids on a couple different teams who have, uh, they will be com completely unable to attend because they have conflicting events. And we're just wondering if there's any hope of us being able to change lanes. It, it really depends upon which tournament you're thinking about because if you're thinking one of the tournaments that's at the end of the season those are all <laughs> yep exactly yes we had a hard time placing trying to get everybody yep. yeah 
Yeah, it's hard. It's a short season. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> it goes quick. So you're looking to change to different tournament or different days and stuff? Is that what you're? Yeah, we we were assigned uh, November twentieth, but gotcha. we were hoping uh, hoping against hope to to get one of the later tournaments. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I, good luck. I mean, we talked to tournament directors actually last night, and they kind of want to lock things down ASAP. So just yeah. <laughs> so they're in the opposite yeah. situation. They want to start get it get started with their paperwork and all the yep, stuff that yep. they need to do. So yeah, I don't think there's a lot of hope there. I don't want to give you a false hope, Debbie. We're uh, it's yeah, kind of done, no, right? I believe it's it's fairly okay. done. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Nope. That's that's it. Is what it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. so. Can you throw it on the slide to see if anyone can switch? Um, I'm not sure that's going to be something that tournament that, organizers are going to allow, Heather. No. I don't believe that's I, a good I think, idea. Yeah, I think we're pretty much locked in and, and locked in. That's probably the um, best way to... <laughs> yeah, I got you. I know, Heather, you're just trying to help. Um, but the tournament directors uh, kind of want everything done locked in teams where they belong so they can start with their paperwork. Yes. I've had several people call me asking for switching and I've had to say no. So Any other questions? It's going to open to any topic that you guys want. I know that a lot of you guys are volunteering this year. I saw um, a couple comments from different people that haven't volunteered before, so we appreciate that. Um, please do, if you have time at a, at a tournament that your team is not at, just volunteer if you if you can for us and kind of learn what goes on behind the scenes. Judging volunteering is a phenomenal way to get to really learn the game. Yeah, I know, Emily. You were, you were one of the ones that I saw that was signed up for, for judging this year. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. It opens your eyes to a whole new aspect of the game. You, know, you get to see behind the closed doors what, you know, like we, we think we know what the judges and stuff are really looking for, and, and the rubrics are out there, but you kind of get to really understand what they are looking for, right? So, yep. Yeah, um, if you're available any of the days, just go to your firstinspires.org website. Or a portal, do a search for any of the tournaments that you're able to volunteer for, uh, click on there, and select the, anything that you're willing to do, and uh, just submit your application. Uh, separate question, or maybe about tournaments. Do you guys have a, like a channel for tournament organizers as well? Like a Slack, a separate Slack channel for that? Oh, I thought you were saying channel four. Like news. I was oh. like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. That's way beyond me. My enunciation. My, my bad. No, but I, I'm wondering if you have a, like a separate Slack channel for uh, people organizing scrimmages or, or events. Um, in, the, uh, in the past two years uh, through COVID, we were using, for our remote tournaments, we were using the FLL uh, volunteer Slack uh for that this season okay. there has not been any, any activity on it yet but that is um if we did need to use slack for that that's probably what we we would use okay i, I only ask we we're interested eventually in in running a tournament or or some sort of event even if it's just a scrimmage uh at our um, school so just kind of wanted to get connected into that okay There are and then maybe we can plan it the last possible day. <laughs> there, there are certainly um, coaches that you um, do not want to be stuff. the last possible date as your first <laughs> experience running a tournament. Right. <laughs> I, I used to run the Iowa tournaments uh, years and years ago, <laughs> help run, not run it myself. Of course, it's much bigger than that. But yeah, I guess you know, over there. as you get closer, Ryan, to wanting to do that, reach out and probably. Uh, Typically, we yes. recommend a shadowing. 
I think we re reached out. Uh, I, we would be interested in, I, I don't know how involved the shadowing process is, uh, or if it's just like, you know, stay on an email chain and then uh, show up, you know, a little bit before the event or, or like volunteer. I, I don't know what, what you guys, um, what, what shadowing entails, but uh, yeah, I think we're interested. Where are you guys at, Brian? Oh, Ryan, sorry. Uh, we're we're at the University School of oh, Milwaukee. Oh, okay, awesome. So, yeah. Um, River Hills. Gotcha. Yep, I know where it is. I'm in Milwaukee area myself. Nice. Okay. Anything else, guys? Um, this is Sue. Hi, Sue. Um, I was wondering about how big the tournaments are. I know the earlier ones are tinier and later ones might be bigger. Mm -hmm. So what we've got right now is um, the last uh, four tournaments are all 24 teams to uh, 28 teams. Um, then we have several others. One that's on November 12th has um, 27 teams. They're looking to go up a little bit higher. Um, the, most of the ones that are on November 12th are um, in the 20s. We have November 13th, one of the Sundays, that one is gonna have 12. So we have some openings earlier on, but then um, later on they're full. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to all the tournaments and best of luck to all your teams. Craig, I just saw you come Thanks, off folks. mute. Did you need something? Yeah, I just saw you come oh, off mute. I just mute. want to say thank you. Oh, Appreciate okay. it, guys. Gotcha. All right, thanks. Sure. Have a nice night. Thanks, thank guys. Thank you all. Bye. Take care.